Genesis chapter 44, and we will read verse 14, verse 14. So you might recall that uh, Joseph, he reveals himself, uh, he's going to reveal himself to his brothers, but he first uh, brings them in. He brings them in and claims that they stole his silver cup and that he caught them for it. So the brothers, they're in heavy grief here. They're in heavy grief. What are they going to do now that Benjamin has to be left behind? Joseph just wants Benjamin to stay and to work for him as a slave, as a servant, while the rest of the brothers uh, can go home. In verse 18, here we begin. So if we look at verse 18 through 34, this is a great picture of a repentant sinner confessing to Christ for salvation and putting on a substitute, on a real, actual substitute for their salvation. So putting their trust on Jesus Christ, obviously. So this is a perfect picture of ABC, believe it or not. It's a perfect picture of ABC right here in this case. All right, let's go to the book of Genesis chapter 44. Genesis 44, and then verse 14. And Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there, and they fell before him on the ground. All right, I'm going to explain each and every word what it means. So basically, Judah and his brothers, they go to Joseph's house, and Joseph was still there. He was still in the house, so he was waiting for them. And then all the brothers, they fell down before him on the ground. They uh, bowed down to him. Verse 15, And Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that ye have done? What ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine? So Joseph says to his brothers, What is this action that you've done? What's this deed, this crime that you've caused? What means no. So that's an archaic English for no. Didn't you know that a man like me would certainly divine the cup, a reverence, uh, take the cup as something important and divine? Because remember, Joseph's cup is pretty much pagan or even occultic. It's part of uh, the Egyptians' uh, pagan possessions, occultic possessions. Verse 16, and Judah said, what shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? So Judah says, what can we say to my Lord? What can we say? Uh, what can we speak? How can we even clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. He says, God found out our sin. Of your servants. Now, that's quite a statement. Then what he's finally doing, which the brothers have not done all this time, is if we look at the previous chapters, they'll, they'll admit that uh, they've sinned, but they only say it to each other as a blame game. You might recall that in the prison. Or they might be going, oh, God is punishing us because of the sins we've committed. But there's no actual confession to the person they committed the crime against. So notice right here, he finally confessed to Joseph that he and his brothers have truly done wrong. This is what Joseph has been waiting for. And that's in C. God has been waiting all this time for you to confess to him. We see right here, A, an acknowledgement of sin. So that's also another word where we could put repentance. And then also that confession to God. Judah is picturing a sinner who finally uh, confesses to God as a repentant sinner for salvation. Uh, we're going to come in believing very soon. But we're seeing that they're finally doing that. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. Judah says, look, uh, all of us will become my Lord's servants, your servants, both us and also the one where you found the cup. So he's trying to include himself with Benjamin here. Verse 17, and he said, God forbid that I should do so. 
but the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. Joseph says, uh, God forbid. The idea is that's an expression basically, no, no way that this will happen. Uh, that would be a horrible thing. That's another meaning. No way that I'm going to do this. The one, the man, in uh, where we found the cup, whose hand, who's responsible for it, he's going to become my servant. The rest of you, you can go back in peace to your father. Uh, no hand will touch you. You don't have to be a servant. Now, if you think about typically uh, Judah and the brothers, it would be their mentality of disposing Jacob's favorite son. Remember Joseph, right? They would, if this was Joseph back then, uh, when they sold him off as a slave, the brothers would be content. Yeah, uh, take Joseph as the slave or as a servant while the rest of us go free. That's, a matter of fact, what they did. So Joseph, he's repeating, notice right here, the same scenario. You notice that. So let's take away Jacob's favorite son, Benjamin, as a slave. Let's see how you would react. The brothers this time, they're acting in repentance right here, and uh, they're not going to let this slide. It's not like before, where, well, I don't give a flip about Jacob's favorite son. He can see the jealousy is gone. He can see their repentance is genuine. He can see that his brothers have changed. They're not the same as before. Because if you recall, in the previous chapters, Joseph let his brothers rot in prison a couple days, right? Because he wanted to think, but more so he wanted his brothers to think, to contemplate the, their wickedness. That's the reason why Joseph, he set them up with the silver cup, because he's still trying them. He's still testing them if they really changed. If we look at verse 18, Judah gives a response that shows a change. He's not going to let it go. He's not going to say, okay, let's go back to our father. Good riddance to the favorite boy. Nope. Verse 18, then Judah came near unto him and said, O my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears and let not thine anger burn against thy servant for thou art even as Pharaoh. So Judah, he approaches near to Joseph. So uh, Dr. Upman gives this touching scenery in his Adler commentary, but what you can picture is here the king is far away over there, all right? Uh, not the king, but the, uh, Joseph being the ruler, far away over there. The brothers are bowing down before him. Judah, he gets up, and then he starts to approach Joseph as he pleads with him. Now, when you do that, uh, Joseph, you can imagine his emotions would be tugged very hard after that seeing the repentance in his brother's face, seeing him pleading with him, but approaching him up close. Joseph does not get the luxury of escaping this time. You might recall when his brothers were there, he ran away to his bedroom to uh, cry. When he imprisoned his brothers and he heard their acknowledgement and uh, blaming each other for their sin, he was crying, but he hid himself. This time he can't hide. So he can't run or hide. Judah's approaching to him, pleading with him. And Judah says, uh, Oh my Lord, that's how he addresses him. Uh, Please let your servant, I beg you, I beseech you, speak, uh, speak something. Just give a word for your ears to hear. Please, uh, am I cut off now? or? Okay then. He says, uh, please don't let your anger uh, burn against your servants. So the idea is, don't let your anger uh, increase, be intensified. Because you're like even Pharaoh. So he's trying to credit him, trying to appease his anger. Verse 19, my Lord asked his servants, saying, have ye a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, we have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother is dead. And he alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. Okay, the idea is in verse 19, Judah is explaining that when you, my Lord, asked your servants, asked us, 
by saying, do you have a father or do you have a brother? We said to you, my Lord, we do have a father. He's an old man. And there's also a child of his old age, a little one. So that's referring to Benjamin. So his favorite. And then we had another one. His brother, Joseph, is dead. And he, Benjamin, is left alone from his mother's side. Because remember, Rachel's a mother. She only gave birth to Joseph and Benjamin. Joseph's dead, and Benjamin's the only one that's left. And his father loveth him. So the father really loves Benjamin. And thou saidest unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. So, uh, also, you've said to, for us to bring Benjamin to you so that uh, you can see him for, uh, for your own eyes. Verse 22, And we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave, leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. And thou saidest unto thy servants, Except your youngest brother shall come down with you, he shall see my face no more. The uh, meaning is that we said to uh, my Lord that the young boy, that's the lad, he can't leave his dad. For if he's going to leave his dad, Jacob is going to die. And you said to us, your servants, unless you bring your youngest brother uh, down from Canaan to Egypt with you, you can't see my face. Verse 24, and it came to pass when, my, when we came up unto thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, go again and buy us a little food. And we said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother be with us, then will we go down. For we may not see the man's face except our youngest brother be with us. So the idea is, uh, meaning, verse 24, it just so happened, that's what it came to pass is referring to, when we came to your servant, which is our father or my father, uh, we told him your words. But our father said, uh, hey, go again and buy us just a little bit of food. And we replied to him, look, we can't go down to Egypt unless our youngest brother goes with us. Then we can go. Because we can't see the man's face or the governor's face except the youngest brother, Benjamin, goes with us. Verse 27. So remember, as I explain, see how it matches every word in the verse, okay? I want to make sure that you do that. That way you can understand every word here. Verse 27. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, You know that my wife bare me two sons, and the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces, and I saw him, saw him not since. And if he take this also from me, and mischief befall him, he shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. So, verse 27, the meaning is, So your servant, which is my father, said to us, Hey, you all know, that's what ye is, it's plural for you all. So, you all know that my wife gave birth to two boys, and the one went out from me. So, the one is away from me. He's gone. He's no longer with me. And I said, man, certainly he's torn to shreds, and I never saw him since. If you take this boy as well from me, and something bad uh, befalls him, something bad happens to him, you're going to bring down, uh, and the idea is, my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. That's the saying that you commonly heard, that you, when you get stressed out, you get gray hairs, right? So he's going to be so stressed out with sorrow that he's going to have gray hairs and then die at the grave. Now, there are two things right here that we can notice uh, from the picture. I'm going to kind of go back and forth. I don't know if they could see that, all right, with this pulpit in the way. So J Joseph is picturing Jesus here. Uh, remember what Judah said. Judah mentioned that the brother is dead. That's the word that he used, right? We'll notice that in verse uh, 20. Verse 20. Is dead. Then we notice also right here, torn in pieces. Verse 28. Torn in pieces. These two is exactly the kind of wording that was prophesied of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. When he died on the cross, the Bible says that he died and he was torn in pieces. All right, so let's look at the book of Psalm.
We're going to look at the book of Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Psalm 22. If I could also ask, make sure that your cell phones are turned off for silence, please. All right? I just want to stress that just in case. Now, notice in Psalm 22, we can see that this is referring to Jesus Christ's death. In Psalm 22, 1, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That sounds like Jesus Christ when he died on the cross, right? So this is no doubt a prophecy of Jesus Christ. But notice right here that in this context, in verse 12, many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. Verse 16, for dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. Verse 21, uh, save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorn. Now, notice right here so far, the entire wording here is that Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, it's like he's torn apart, torn apart. Another wording is verse 14. It says, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. So the metaphorical expression about being torn apart is referring to uh, Jesus Christ, and that matches with Joseph, where they thought that he was torn to shreds as well. Okay, uh, returning back at Genesis. Genesis. There's no doubt Joseph uh, typifies Jesus Christ. We see that over and over again in the Bible. Genesis 44, and we look at verse 30. <clears throat> now, therefore, when I come... To thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, he shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die. And thy servants shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. All right, in verse 30 to 31, the, uh, the meaning is, so look, when uh, I come to your servant, which is my father, and the young boy is not with us. And the father sees that, uh, uh, and I see that my father's life is bound up. It's intertwined uh, with the young boy's life. That's how close they are together. Then it's, verse 31, then it's going to happen when Jacob sees that the young boy is not with us, that he's going to die. And your servants are going to be responsible for giving gray hairs to your servant, who's my father, with sorrow to the grave. Verse 32, for thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father, saying, if I bring him not, uh, not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Judah says, uh, because your servant is responsible, became surety. The idea is that he became sure. He basically put a commitment, a promise to uh, the young boy, Benjamin, to his father saying, if I don't bring Benjamin uh, to you, then I'm going to be responsible uh, and bear the blame of uh, Jacob, uh, my father, forever. Uh, Brother Tom? If uh, that's Sister Kimberly, uh, have them invited. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't notify the security, so that's my bad. All right? Yeah. All right. Continuing onwards, uh, let's see. Notice right here uh, in verse 33. Now, therefore, I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, uh, abomin to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. So Judah says, so I beg you, let your servant here stay uh, in his place instead of the young boy Benjamin as a servant to my Lord. And let the young boy go free uh, with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father and the lad be not with me? 
lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father. Judah says, for how can I go to my father and the young boy is not with me? Uh, otherwise, it's possible I'm going to see some mischief, some unfortunate evil that's going to fall on my father as a, as a result. Okay, so understanding that from Genesis 44, we get a great picture here. Judah, uh, remember his name is uh, similar, or basically, uh, he pictures Jesus Christ. Judah pictures Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ takes the blame on our behalf. So notice right here that the brothers, right? They're acknowledging their sinful part from their confession. The trust and the responsibility can all rely upon Judah who takes the blame. There's your B right there, believing on Jesus Christ. Benjamin is inclusive with the brothers here, and he equals what? Death. And remember, this is, isn't this interesting? When you go to Genesis uh, 44, when you go to Genesis 44, in verse 16, what did uh, Judah recognize? He recognized that even though Benjamin's the one who faces, quote-unquote, the death sentence, so to speak, or the crime, the penalty, all the brothers share that. All the brothers share the penalty right here. Why? Because they're all caught with their sin, he says. That's really good right there. Uh, that picture's what? Romans 5.12. Go to Romans 5.12. So when we recognize our sinful condition, we got to realize none of us is an exception to death. Everyone receives it. The Bible says that there's no exception. Uh, death does not discriminate. It is brutal. It will take in everybody. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. You can get one man who sins, and then death happens, but that infects the rest of the group. Romans 5, 12, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, kind of like Benjamin and death by sin, just one, and then death follows. And so death passed upon one man, it says all men, why? For that all have sinned. So it was one man, Adam, sin, uh, that passed upon all men, and that's why all sinners have to die. Same thing, one man, Benjamin, and then he represents death. But it's not just infecting one man, Benjamin. It infects the rest of his brothers. Why? For they all sinned. Judah said, we all sinned. That's a really good picture right here. There's no doubt that we can get a very good picture of a soul receiving Christ for salvation. We see ABC, a very beautiful picture here. Now, another thing is, uh, when we go back to the main text here, so Jesus Christ takes the blame, right? He becomes surety for us, takes our evil in our stead. Uh, man, great passages. Go to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And then I want you to also go to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Two, First Peter 2. There's going to be three passages we're going to look at, all right? First of all, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 Peter 2, and then we'll look at the third one later. So Judah takes the blame, all right? Here are these sinners who realize, hey, we acknowledge we've all sinned, and we all deserve to take the death penalty. But then what they're going to have to resort to, their saving grace right here, where they can get out, is that, they need their substitute. And Judah says, I will take the blame for everybody because I'm surety of it. Picturing Jesus Christ who takes the blame on the behalf of all these sinners who recognize their sinful condition and knowing that they deserve to die. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Notice that Jesus takes the blame. Verse 21, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, 
that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Christ takes our sin, the blame, so that we can be free. Look at 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2. Notice in verse, uh, let's see, verse 24, verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Uh, Judah said, let me bear the blame, All right? Notice Jesus Christ bore the blame for us. 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. 1 Peter 3. 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So notice right here that Jesus Christ, uh, as the just person who did no wrong, takes the blame, uh, goes in the stead of the unjust. All right, going back, going back right here, going back. And then, can you picture that? Judah is going to Joseph every step of the way, saying that we can't go back to my father. Our father is going to die without the son Benjamin. We're all guilty. We've all done wrong. Let the lad go free. Let me take the blame. I deserve it. Please, I'm begging you. Now, when, when you're doing that and you're approaching closer and closer to, yep. to Joseph, Joseph, there's no way he can keep the emotions inside. There's no way for him to run or hide this time since Judah's approaching him. So he bursts at Genesis 45, verse 1. Here's a happy story, very touching story. Genesis 45, 1. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. So uh, the meaning right here is that, so after what happened, Joseph could not hold himself back. He couldn't refrain himself in front of everyone that stood near him, that were in his presence. So then all of a sudden, you know, he's holding back the tears and he's going with that poker face, and then he just cries out, everyone get out of here! That's the idea. <laughs> Calls every man to go out from me. So no one was there except uh, Joseph and his brothers. So J everyone left while Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. Verse 2, And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? So in verse Genesis 45, 2, Joseph, he uh, cries and weeps very loud. And the Egyptians and all of Pharaoh's household heard it. That's how loud he cried. And then Joseph, all of a sudden, he just, uh, just says all of a sudden, Hey, I'm Joseph. Is my father still alive? Now, what do you think his brother's going to do after they hear that? <laughs> They're like, you could, you could probably hear a pin drop, and they're just staring, and then their jaws are wide open. They're like, what? Uh. The middle of verse 3, and his brethren could not answer him. There, I told you, all right? That's self-explanatory. For they were troubled at his presence. No, of course they would be troubled just seeing him. Verse 4, and Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom he sold into Egypt. So Joseph, he says to his brothers, I want you to come uh, near me, uh, I beg you. So they approached him near, and he said, Look, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now these are two verses uh, that picture Basically, Jesus Christ, when he reveals himself, when he uh, died, and then they all thought that he was dead. The disciples thought that he was dead. Jesus Christ revealed himself, and then they were all in shock. Same thing. Uh, the, Joseph's brothers thought he was dead. But then Joseph reveals himself, I am Joseph, and they were in shock. 
Another thing to notice is that Joseph's brothers were troubled at verse 3, at his presence. So there's still disbelief here, right? Or confusion or like what's going on. So then what Joseph does at verse 4 is that he, chal uh, he uh, challenges them basically. He says, just come near me. All right, see, it's me. I am Joseph. Same thing with Jesus Christ, where the people were in disbelief, but then he'll tell them, hey, touch my hands and my side. Come near me. Look, I am he. I am Jesus Christ. Okay, so uh, let's look at several things here. This is very good. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. Now keep your hand at 1 Corinthians 15 because I've got another one that's interesting. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. And then I want your second hand, your second hand to uh, go to John 20. Uh, John 20. All right. A lot of good pictures here. There's no doubt G uh, Joseph pictures Jesus Christ. Look at John chapter 20. John chapter 20 and 1 Corinthians 15. So look at right here at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. Okay, so Jesus died. But notice in verse 5, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. So notice Jesus died, but then he revealed himself to the brethren. Now keep your hand at 1 Corinthians 15 because there's another doozy I'm going to show you here. But go to John 20. Go to John 20. John 20. Look at verse 26. So Jesus reveals himself, but then he challenges them to uh, touch him. John 20, 26. And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. All right, going back to 1 Corinthians 15. We see how this perfectly matches with Joseph in trying to uh, challenge his brothers to... Uh, get rid of their skepticism and to really believe that it is him, that he is alive, that he's not dead, just like Jesus did to his disciples. Now, the interesting thing, if we're going to tie all of this together, in verse 7, we read that. So, uh, verse 7, uh, after that he was seen of James and of all the apostles. So, Jesus reveals himself, right? But notice the last person who he reveals himself. Verse 8, and last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. Now, notice right here, this is important. So Jesus revealed himself to Paul then at the last. Meaning then, Paul was in the same boat like the other disciples. He thought Jesus was dead. But Jesus revealed himself to Paul, no, look, I am alive. And he revealed himself to Paul. Okay. When did Jesus reveal himself to Paul? Now, the common passage that's used, now there are different theories and stuff like that, but let's just go by the common one. Let's go to the book of Acts. Let's go to Acts 9. Let's go to Acts 9. So if this was uh, the place where Jesus revealed himself to Paul, and that's what most people commonly use, notice what Jesus said, all right? Acts chapter 9. When Jesus reveals himself to Paul, what does he say at Acts 9, verse 5? Acts 9, verse 5. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, What? I am Jesus. What did Joseph say back at Genesis 45 when he revealed himself to his brothers? I am Joseph. How about that? All right, go to Genesis 45. Ain't that cool, man, about the Bible? Pretty cool about the Bible. Go to Genesis chapter 45. So revealing that he's alive with the statement, I am, and then the name. That's what Joseph and Jesus Christ both did. 
All right, now this is where we're going to get into something theological, and it's going to be important against Calvinism. Genesis 45, 5. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that he sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Uh, Joseph says, so don't be grieved, all right? Don't be in sorrow. Don't even be upset at yourselves uh, that you sold me. Because God's the one that sent me for you to preserve life, to protect all of us from the famine. Verse 6, For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years, in the which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. And God sent me uh, before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Okay, the meaning is, in verse 6, for these past two years, the famine's been sore and it's been spreading throughout the land, and there are still five years left in which you can't plow. So that's what earing means. That's the archaic word for plowing, and you can't even harvest. So God sent me for you to preserve all of you where we can continue our lineage and to save our lives in the earth through such a great deliverance. Deliverance, right? Great deliverance. Jesus Christ, he is known as the deliverer of our sins. Go to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 2. Jesus Christ also delivered us. He basically saved us from our sins. Look at the book of uh, Luke chapter uh, 1. Excuse me, Luke chapter 1. Notice what was known about uh, Jesus Christ. All right. We're going to look at uh, Luke chapter 1 and then verse 31. Luke chapter 1 and verse 31. Notice right here, the Bible says, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name, what? Jesus. That thing is repeated by the angel. That thing is also uh, repeated by the angel later on. But before we go to that one, notice uh, what Mary said at verse 47. Verse 47. She said, And my spirit hath rejoiced in God. Notice right here, my Savior, my Savior. We'll also notice right here that at verse 77, in verse 77, the Bible says to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sin. So notice the deliverance right here. Look at verse 74, 74. That he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. So notice that Jesus Christ is known as the deliverance. Now repeating the angel's statement, we can go to the book of uh, Matthew chapter 1. You can go to uh, Matthew chap chapter 1. All right. In verse 21, notice that the angel mentions that thou shalt call his name Jesus because the meaning itself is to deliver. It's to save the people from their sins. Matthew 1, 21. And he shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. So Joseph was sent to be their deliverer. And Jesus Christ was sent to be our deliverer. Okay, going back. Going back. In verse 8. Genesis 45, verse 8. Notice right here, So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and a lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. So Joseph says to his brothers, so it's not, it wasn't you that sent me to Egypt. It was actually God. God's the one who made me actually like a father figure to Pharaoh and even a lord over all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. So God gave a lot of favor to Joseph in the eyes of Pharaoh. Now this uh, has been a passage infamously used by Calvinists. It's Genesis 45 and also another passage is Genesis chapter 50. 
Genesis chapter 50. And then uh, notice right here that in verse 20, Genesis 50, verse 20, it seems as if when the Joseph, uh, excuse me, that when Joseph's brothers committed the sin, that it was not their free choice. It was God's sovereignty or, you know, Calvinist whatever that just forced them to do it. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto God unto good, to bring it to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. So this is their famous passage on Calvinism and compatibilism, or whatever theological terminologies that they want to call it. Me, I just call it heresy. All right? It's that simple. Now, uh, when we look at these uh, passages right here, uh, instead of uh, proving Calvinist election, the choices of uh, Joseph's uh, brothers that they made, it actually uh, proves something right here. We see basically God's sovereignty. So I'll just put S right here, save some spelling space. But basically how God's sovereignty is using the free will of man for his glory. It's that simple. Basically, God is so sovereign that he don't have to force people to do anything. He can have people choose whatever they want to do, but God is so sovereign that uh, he, he's not such a dummy or he's so weak that, oh my goodness, what, what am I going to do? People's free choices is going to go against my plan. That's a weak God if you're a Calvinist God. A weak God is a Calvinist God who has to robotically control people where their choices are already predetermined and predestinated and then controlled by God to do his bidding. So that's not a, a powerful God. That's a weak God. All right. But I'll tell you what a powerful God is. No matter what choice you make, it's going to fulfill his plan. Whatever free choice you make, you can sin or you can live for God. I don't care. But God is so sovereign. He can use anything for his glory. Now, isn't that easy? That's a simple answer to debunk Calvinism. I don't know why they never thought of that. All right. I never know why they never thought of that. But there are some Christian scholars. This is a, a genuine thing that's even taught by scholars. But there's a thing where God is so sovereign that even uh, when he... Basically, the idea is this. So here is foreknowledge. He sees somebody free choices at play here, right? And then he sees all possible scenarios, whatever the person's going to do. So the idea is... That because God sees ahead of time what the person will freely do. Now, you don't think God has that kind of power? Otherwise, why would that be foreknowledge, right? See, uh, if God uh, knows what the person is going to decide freely for himself or herself, then that's quite a God, and he's not going to let that go to waste. And then he says, I'm going to use that, then I'm going to put my plan into action that will match up their free choice that they made. So the idea is, is this is even taught by theologians. Even if we were to uh, believe or teach that God basically predetermined, so to speak, or planned something long ago before we were created on what's, how things are going to turn out, that doesn't take away people's free choices. Basically... You can even say before everything was created, God already knew what people would freely decide for themselves. So because God already knew ahead of time what so-and-so is going to decide freely for himself or herself, then God's like, I'm going to put my plan into motion like that. So how do we see right here that free choice and his sovereignty are in play together right here? Rather than... Uh, God controlling the free will of man. Well, it's pretty simple right here because we see that at Genesis chapter 45, when we look at uh, Genesis chapter uh, 45, he says right here that it's their free choice. Notice in verse 5, he says that ye sold me hither, right? So it's their choice that they made. But notice that God did send me before you to preserve life. But God's sovereignty is at play. Over here, notice in verse 20, Genesis 50, verse 20, chapter 50, verse 20, they did evil. That's from their own actions, their free choice. 
If you say God was the one controlling that, then God would be the one doing evil. See that? So it's so important to put free choice here, otherwise you're going to attribute evil to God. So that's a huge problem with Calvinism. So this demands free choice here, because no Calvinist would dare say that God's the one who, uh, God's the one who can be attributed with sin. No, they wouldn't dare do that. So then, in order to bypass that, the only way you can bypass that is mankind, from their free choice, did the evil. Well, we bypass that by saying that the human was the one who actually did the sin, whereas God controlled them and made them do it. Why would, that's so stupid, man. That's like me taking a robot and using a robot to kill somebody. So the responsibility is not me. It's that robot's fault. You know, that, that, that's so silly, man. Yep. That is so silly. That's a dumb thing to say. So notice right here that you have to put the blame against someone who actually does the evil, who's responsible for the evil. So there is no doubt free will is attributed at verse 20, while at the same time God's sovereignty at play in perfect balance. Verse 20. You see that the free choice of man is at play with God's sovereignty at play as well. So God's like, okay, you did the evil. That is evil, that is wicked, and that is from your action. But uh, you know what I can do? I can have that fulfill my plan in a good way. That's what God can do. Isn't that simple? Now, uh, I've heard too, much, uh, too many arguments, all right? Calvinists will always accuse uh, yours truly of, you're not interpreting us correctly. That's, uh, you don't know what we teach and stuff like that. I heard the yakety yak so many times, all right? Now, let's make this simple, fool, okay? Rather than accusing yours truly for not understanding, tell me which part I did not understand, explain it clearly why that is incorrect in an understandable way, unless you're a coward, all right? And then the third thing, the third thing, then I'll admit my mistake after that. But these Calvinists, these cowards who champion their debaters, they're like, oh, you know, we love so-and-so, we love so-and-so. And then these so-and-sos who are supposedly great debaters accuse yours truly about misunderstanding Calvinism. They don't even address one single argument that I brought up against Calvinism. They don't dismantle that. They don't show the faults. Well, I show their faults, and they accuse me for misunderstanding them. How would they like that if I told them that? Well, you, you misunderstood me. You don't know what you're talking about. When they're accusing me and when they catch me in error. You try that, all right? If you catch me for heresy and I say, well, you just misunderstood, you know? That's a coward. That is a cowardly way to prove that you're right, all right? You try that in court. You think the judge is going to uh, pound the gavel in your favor when a lawyer, all he says is, you misunderstood the criminal, your honor. You don't know his honest intentions. You just misunderstood him. Stupid, man. No, the, the, you give the evidence, the arguments that are laid out clearly for everyone to see and understand. You don't hide it in an abstract way. Calvinists. That's what they do all the time. Cowards. All right, Genesis chapter 45. I'm done. All right. I always ran, uh, the biggest thing I always rant against and I criticize the hardest, remember, is not sinners, but scholars. I pound them very hard because scholars have been responsible, if you study our history, they have been responsible for the dark ages, for people who went through uh, starvation, who went through all kinds of pain, who went through dictatorship, and scholars are responsible for spreading out sin, justifying sin, spreading out sin. All right, Genesis 45. Verse 9, Haste ye, and go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me lord over all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. So Joseph says, I want you all to hurry up. That's what ye means again. That's a plural for you all. And I want you to go up. So because Egypt is down, Canaan is up, right? I want you to go up to where my father is, and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says, God made me lord over all Egypt, come down, so up from Canaan down to Egypt, come down to where, come down to me and don't live here. Verse 10, and thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks and thy herds, and all that thou hast. And there will I nourish thee, for there are yet 
For yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. Okay, so remember, see how each and every explanation I say matches each and every word in the verse. I'm going to explain to you what the verse is saying. So in verse 10, Joseph, it, Joseph continues uh, his message to his father. You will dwell, you're going to live in the land of Goshen. You're going to be near me. Uh, you, your children, and your grandchildren. That's your children's children. And, you know, your flock, your herds, and all that you have. So basically all your cattle, your livestock, and everything you own will live near me. You're going to be with me. And at that place, I will take care of you. I'm going to nourish you. Because there's still five years of famine left, so I have to take care of you, feed you. Otherwise, you and your house, your house and everything you have will come to poverty. Verse 12, And behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that it is my mouth that speaketh unto you. And ye shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt, and of all that ye have seen. And ye shall haste and bring down my father hither. So Joseph says, in verse 12 to 13, And look, so that's what behold is meaning, look, your eyes can see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that it's my mouth that is speaking to you. And you're going to tell my father of everything that basically you saw and that you heard from my mouth. So that's what he means of all my glory in Egypt. So everything that you, your mouth and your eyes experienced and uh, all the glory, all, you know, the rulership, the power, everything that I own, how God blessed me in Egypt. And of everything you saw and you're going to hurry up and bring down my father over here. Joseph's brothers are responsible for seeing the glory of Joseph, everything that they saw and that they heard. And their job is to take that message to their father, Jacob, and bring their father, uh, Jacob, uh, from a place that's dying to a place that is rich. All right, so Jesus Christ, in his glorified state after he resurrected, Disciples saw that, they heard his words, and then they take that message to the lost sinner out there who are dying and going to hell, and then bringing them to a, pla a place of blessing and uh, richness in Jesus Christ and life. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, see, the disciples heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, their eyes also saw it. They beheld Jesus' glory. And our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and what? Show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. That's what Joseph's brother said to Jacob, their father. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. That's what Joseph told them. What you've seen with your eyes and my mouth that you've heard. That ye also may have fellowship with us. So that is the message of us Christians. So the disciples, they beheld the glory of Jesus Christ. They heard his words and then they showed it to us. And we in return share that message to a lost and dying world. All right. I hope you enjoyed today's lesson on Joseph. Father God, thank you so much for the truth and the revelation of thy word. What a book, Lord, showing not just doctrine, but also pictures, Lord, and figures. Yeah. This book can be applied in so many different ways. It's such an amazing book, Father. Uh, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.